Good evening, fancy meat computers. Welcome, 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 everyone, welcome all. And, uh, I hope that everybody's having a good day. Uh, happy Friday, everybody. Um, I don't think we have any announcements, but let me just check. Sometimes they sneak one in on me. And by they, I mean the TAs. Nope, no new announcements. Good. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Oh. Oh my gosh. Not the dad joke. You are in the wrong class, my friend. You are in the wrong class for no dad jokes. Everybody, everybody in the chat, put your favorite dad joke in the chat. I, I I might read appropriate ones in my dad voice. Fifty four viewers, not bad. How am I feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good. Things are uh Things are doing pretty well. A bit more snow on the ground, but, uh, you know. You have to post the answer, because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read it if the answer is dirty. Yeah. What did the buffalo say to his son? Bye, son. Meh. Singing in the shower is fun until you get soap in your mouth. Then it's a soap opera. Wah, wah. I'm hungry. Hi, hungry. I'm dad. Why do you talk to me this way? <laughs> Feeling pretty good is a dad joke. No, no, you see, that is not the essence of dad jokery. It has to be a pun, which does not imply depression on your part, right? Like the fact you're saying, I feel pretty good, and you intend that as a joke, that's not a dad joke. See, that's like a millennial joke, right? Um... The joke, like, the joke about millennials is, like, you know, everything is depressing and nihilistic, you know? So, there were... Oh. There were two chess players sitting in a lobby of a building talking about recent victories. Chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. Nah. <laughs> what does a nosy pepper do? Gets jalapeno business. Huh? I don't know. What kind of jewelry do rabbits wear? Does Felix like your dad jokes? Well, he's not really... He doesn't really understand language yet. He's only uh, nine and a half months. So, not yet, but he will. Don't worry. I asked my dog, what's two minus two? He said nothing. What do you call a le cow with no legs? Ground beef. Ah! What do you call a cow with two legs? Lean ground beef. What do you call a cow with four legs? High stakes. Why do melons have weddings? Because they can't elope. Wah, 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 wah. What kind of jewelry do rabbits wear? 14. Carrot gold. Why is Peter Pan always flying? Because he never lands. Nah. These are, these are all terrible, and I, I love it. Did you hear about the cheese factory explosion? All that was left was debris. <laughs> oh. All right. About time we got down to business, I'd say. Thank you for all of these cheesy jokes, especially that last one. So, um, we just have a couple of slides to wrap up in this topic. Sorry we're a little bit behind, guys, but the, uh, the snow day really... We're going to feel it. We're going to feel that snow day, like, around topic four. So, all right, let's see if we can keep a roll on, eh? So, we were talking about some of the a different aspects of programming languages, how you categorize different programming languages. We examined the difference between high and low-level languages. We, ex examined the ugh, we examined the difference between application-specific and general-purpose 
uh, um, languages, and we discussed the difference between interpreted and compiled languages. We also un uh, we came to an understanding of the three major categories of programming languages. So how does that all apply? Um, so what are the like what are the on the ground differences uh, between programming languages? And like this one slide, like people spend their entire careers researching stuff like this this slide is like a whole area of research right but you know so the differences in programming languages the most obvious one is what we call syntax um so that's the actual symbols that encode the language themselves some languages will use different symbols to mean the same thing so for a not equals operation some languages use you know greater than or less than greater than or bang equals i've seen slash equals i've seen equals e like you can actually there is actually a not equals character that you can use um using words like beginning or end or curly braces or indentation to group statements um hello world has too many phonemes yeah yeah really so syntax is a big one some languages it's like if you take a program, a fair, you know, a reasonably simple program, and all you do is convert the syntax, you can translate that lang that program from one language to another between certain languages because the semantics underlying the language are so similar. Um, yeah. So. Another thing that separates languages is the idea of safety. So there are safe languages and there are unsafe languages. Most languages that you'll see these days are considered safe languages because safe means type safe, essentially. Um, another way of phrasing this is, does the language protect its own abstractions? So most languages do this, but a few don't. Uh, especially the lower level, the language, basically the lower the language level, the less protection that you have when you're programming. Um, and basically what protection means in the context of computer programming is protection from your own stupidity. Um, so C does not insulate you from your own stupidity whatsoever. Assembly even less so. Python uh, protects you from quite a lot of your own stupidity. Uh, and it also, like, you know, so typing and type checking is like a whole, um, that's again another, an, an entire area of computer science research, uh, type checking. But essentially, what it, how it works is when you, and I, I know this because I taught a course on this last semester, um, when you have a program that is loaded up by the computer to be executed, there are a bunch of processes that are running in the background that are making sure that you are, for example, applying the right operations to the right types of operands, uh, and lots and lots of other types of things besides. Some, thing, uh, some programming languages do that all up front. Uh, that's known as static type checking. Uh, that would be languages like Java. Some languages do dynamic checking, which is to say, it does its checking when you run the code, not when you uh, compile the code. Uh, this is, of course, this falls pretty, uh, pretty nicely along the compiled interpreted languages split. Um, <clears throat> so, the better the abstractions contained in the language, the more uh, support that language has for large programs. Um, essentially, things get sufficiently complicated uh, with large programs that um, the manner, like, being able to section up the parts of a piece, uh, the, the parts of a program becomes of, at, like, extreme importance. So, these types of things you're probably familiar with from object-oriented programming, like uh, classes, you know, um, and even exceptions and ex exception handling, these are what we consider support for larger programs. Um, Java 
and Python all have classes. You know, practically everything has classes. Uh, most things are object-oriented. Classes and objects are kind of the same thing. We'll get to it. C does not have classes. And I don't really like the class system in Python. I think it's dumb. Um, and exceptions. Um, Java and Python both support them. C does not kind of, it does do signal handling, but that's, you know, kind of a different topic for a different day. Could I clarify what I mean by abstractions? Yeah, sure. So, um, so everything boils down to machine language, right? So assignment statements, the assignment statement itself is an abstraction of a certain portion of machine code, right? The more ways the language gives you of packaging up other pieces of code, the more highly abstract it is. Very, like, basically. So, like, you know, assignment statements are an abstraction mechanism that abstract machine code. Functions are an abstraction mechanism that abstract statements. Classes are an abstraction mechanism that abstract functions, basically. Is Python's use of dynamic check type checking the reason that you don't need to declare type variable types? Uh, no, not not necessarily. It like it doesn't. Um, that's more like how much um, type checking does it do, uh, rather than when it does it. Like that's a that's that's like. Um, the dynamic versus static thing just has to do with when. It it doesn't. It's not an answer to the question how, right? Um, so, although I mean, to some extent, the how is part of when, but you know, or when is part of how. Anyway, uh, to answer your question more properly, um, the reason that you don't have to declare any typing information in Python is because. Python uses a um, uses a lot of fancy mathematics in the background to um, derive what type you meant, basically, and only tell you there's a problem when there's a problem. It's uh, like the mathematics gets fairly complicated, but it uses what's called type inference, um, which um, essentially, if you have an expression. Um, it might have many different valid types, right? But it will also have some invalid types. So if it's, if it's being used in a manner that would suggest an invalid type for that expression, you have a type error. But otherwise, it kind of it's kind of like it's kind of like um, a lot of math goes into a very lazy attitude towards typing information. Uh, so yeah. Another way that programming languages vary greatly is in the degree of library support that you have. Um, Well-liked, well-used languages tend to have large libraries. Basically, the size of the available libraries is proportional to the user base of the language. So, like, the big ones will have lots and lots of standard libraries, and the small ones are have, have very little, right? Um, this is actually what... This is one of the factors that tends to entrench programming languages. Um, and another thing that they vary by is portability to other platforms. So if you have something like assembly language, assembly language basically has to be written for the processor that you have, right? Um, so it's it's not very, like it's, it's highly unportable from one platform to another. Uh, one of the big advances that was represented in the 70s by the C programming language was that it had cross-platform compatibility. Um, and then uh, language, uh, basically Java, and uh, Python follows the Java model. Um, what Java did was it's like, okay, well, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have a the Java virtual machine which will run on top of like we will we'll take care of making the java virtual machine run on practically any hardware setup you as the programmer only have to worry about getting your java code into the java virtual machine 
so and that's that's how that's how java ends up on like all kinds of strange contraptions like mo microcontrollers but um but yeah so portability is a big thing as well generally speaking the higher the level higher the language level is um the more portable it is um so long as the compiler is you know programmed well so so let's talk about python specifically python is a general purpose language it is primarily in the imperative or procedural uh domain it can be used in an object-oriented manner it can be used in a functional manner so basically what you have in python is you have a procedural or imperative language that has features from object-oriented and functional baked into it. So they call it a multi-paradigm language. But, um, you know, um, it's, uh, I, I kind of think that Python is a multi-paradigm language uh, in the same way that pizza is a vegetable because it's got tomato sauce on it. You will discover over the course of this uh, class that Python is actually not my favorite language. Uh, Sarth in the uh, in the comments, let the Python bashing begin. I sometimes refer to it as snake language. So, <clears throat> Python is a high-level language. It supports many mathematical data types, allowing programs to be abstract and easy to understand. Uh, in particular, one of the things, one of the few things about Python that I actually find admirable, is the way that it handles um, aggregate data types, as we're going to see later on. Python has lots and lots and lots of libraries, so um, pretty much any task that you may wish to perform, there's probably a Python library for it. This is kind of a meme about Python, actually. It's kind of like you know, way way back when they were trying to popularize the iPhone. They had this, you know, this campaign slogan, there's an app for that. Uh, well, Python, for Python, there's a library for that. Uh, Python is dynamically typed and not very well typed, if you ask me. Its, uh, it's notation is compact and intuitive. Compact and intuitive. In massive sarcasm quotes. Because what it's actually doing is it's taking uh, parts of uh, programming code that normally do not have semantic content and putting semantic content onto them. We're going to see how this works. Basically, in Python, the level of tabbing that you do, that's actually part of the program. Whereas in most other languages, how far you tab things, that's like your choice as a programmer and the compiler doesn't care. Um, Python is widely used in industry because uh, many, many, many people learn Python because some, somehow, somewhere, about eight years ago, I think, it was, dis you know, uh, the, the graybeards of the ivory tower um, looked into their crystal ball and said, we shall make Python the language everybody learns in first year. And that, thus, Python cemented its place. Um, what is my favorite language and why? I don't really have a favorite language. I like different languages for different reasons. I like Haskell um, just because of the mathematical beauty of it. I like C uh, because if you understand C, you actually understand how a computer works. And I also, like, I like Python because, like, while it messes a lot of it up like there is like a there is a core of good ideas hiding behind you know the uh, sort of a very um an ego a very egotistical construction <laughs> basically um what are the drawbacks of python it's not as easy to write very large languages or very large programs in python um Python is like a small to medium-sized project language, although I'm sure people are going to jump in at me and uh, and and say, oh, I wrote 100,000 million lines of Python code and it worked fine. It's like, oh, yeah. 
Well, maybe it wouldn't have been 100,000 million lines if you used a different programming language. But, um, like, Python has problems. Like, um, in particular, the way that it handles classes is stupid and unintuitive and dangerous. Type dangerous, I mean. Uh, but we're, we have plenty of time to discuss that when we talk about classes. Java is the best because it's used for Minecraft. Meh. Yep. <laughs> Um, Mark is a big fan of Go. Um, what are my thoughts on Java? Oh my god. Um, I have to pull up a meme. You've, you've done it now. You've asked me what I think of Java, and now I have to show you a meme. It's actually a comic, but everything is a meme these days. Malborg, yeah. Um, what are classes? We'll get to there. That's like topic eight. So this this is, I I think this is yeah. Java Java doesn't really do anything that other languages don't now do better. Like Java's day has come and the sun is setting on it. I think. Um, but, like, basically it's just legacy applications like Minecraft that keep Java going. Um, uh, we're going to cover both classes and exceptions later on, so you don't have to worry about understanding them just yet. So Python was initially developed in 1989 by Guido Van Rossum, who is still alive and declared himself benevolent dictator for life of Python. So you can see why I think it's a slightly egotistical language. Uh, it's an open language, so the they have a Python conference every year where they discuss how they're not going to put switch cases in. Um, but uh, I think they actually said that they are going to add switch cases finally. But anyway, um, so Python 3 is the current version of Python. Python 2 um is done so don't it's no longer being supported python 3 is the one that's now being supported so if you're downloading your own python compiler make sure it's python 3 so there we go that's topic one any questions except like teach me classes you know um teach me a topic that we're going to literally spend probably four lectures on in the middle of the class teach that to me right now uh, that's probably not a question i can answer right now I think it's pretty important, actually, for, like, pe particularly a class like this, which is, you know, composed primarily of people outside of the, uh, outside of the programming domain to understand that Python is far and away not the only programming language, and is not even necessarily the best one. Um. <clears throat> so, let's talk about exceptions. Sorry, let's talk about expressions. You've got exceptions on my brain now. So. There we go. Expressions. So. Um, for this, I'm going to tile my display with a running instance of the Python interpreter. So, the Python... You can actually enter Python like lines of code of Python into the interpreter one at a time to just kind of test it, see how it does. This isn't how you would write a program, but it's useful to, like, the output here is the same output that you would receive if you were writing a script. So, um, so we can do arithmetic directly in Python. You know, 1 plus 2 times 6, um, you know, minus 7 divided by... One. There you go. How much easier to learn would you say is Python is to Java? That is the common thing I hear about Python. What are your thoughts about it? Um, 
The fact that there's less fiddly syntax to fiddle with in Python does make it slightly easier to learn for the absolute beginner. But, um, and, you know, like, Python has, like, a decently high skill cap as well. Like, you can do, you can do a lot of really crazy things with Python. The trick is that eventually Python becomes as difficult as any other language, right? It's just, like, the, the initial syntactic barrier has been lowered somewhat. Um, but, yeah, um... Also, it's like, it's it's stupid easy to just get started with Python, you know? Some of these languages, it's like, you gotta, you gotta, like, sell your soul to the devil in order to just get the compiler installed, you know? But anyway. So we can do arithmetic operations, right? Incidentally, asterisk is multiplication. Double asterisk in Python is exponentiation. Some languages will do this as caret, but that's not what that means in uh, in Python. In Python, it's a uh, uh, th this is exponentiation. This is actually a bitwise operation. Don't worry about bitwise. You don't have to know it for this course. So, numbers like three and two point five in our source code are objects. This is object-oriented co coding, so everything is an object, even numbers. Specifically, three uh, these types of numbers are called literal scalar objects. An object is something that can be operated on. A scalar means that it's indivisible and not composed of subcomponents. Another way of thinking of it as a, is as atomic. And literal represents uh, means that it represents what it says, right? This is literally three, right? That is literally four. Generally speaking, you will not hear me refer to these, uh, like these numbers, as literal scalar objects. I will refer to them as literals. So, let's introduce ourselves very briefly to two of a few different data types that you're going to have to learn in this class. Integers, right? So hopefully you guys have taken enough math to have done natural numbers, integers, and real numbers, right? You guys remember that from number theory from uh, elementary school, I hope? Basically, computers represent uh, uh, computers will represent whole numbers and decimal numbers very differently, right? Like there's an actual there's an actual difference in the manner in which the computer stores the information inside of its memory. Um, Seven point nine is stored in a very different way than forty five. So we. So basically, we refer to these as data types. For, uh, so for the whole numbers, or the integers, positive or negative, um, we, well, we, we, the, the abbreviation is int, right? And for real numbers, it's float. Float actually stands for floating point number um, because floating point is a description of how the binary information is represented at at the bit level inside of memory. All you have to know is that float is a real number, so a decimal number. We're going to discuss floating point numbers uh, in a fair amount of detail in the coming weeks. Like we have a whole we have a whole topic on floating point numbers. Operators can be applied to objects to form expressions that yield other objects. So, binary operators apply to two objects, and unary operators apply to one. So, we can apply, you know, one plus, oop, plus one, or uh, let's see, two plus two is equal to four. Um, so, the operation is addition. 
The operator is the plus sign. The operand, the first operand is 2. The uh, second operand is 2. In the case of negation, the operation is negation. The operator is the negative sign. The operand is positive 5. It's kind of interesting. Like, uh, most of the time we kind of just think of this as being negative 5, but to the computer, that's not actually negative 5. What you're doing is you're taking positive 5 and applying the negative sign to it as an operation. So the negative sign is not part of the literal, right? So that's why um, something like the following doesn't, like, well, well, actually it did come out, didn't it? Whoops. Ha! Friggin' Python. In most languages, that wouldn't have worked. In most languages, you would have to have done this. But that's okay. So, we can use the type function to learn the type of an object. So, if we want to know what the type of 5 is, it is of class integer. If we want to know what the class, or what the, what the type of 5.2 is, that's of class float. And just for fun, what is the type of type? It's of class type. Wah, wah. What is the type of plus? Invalid syntax. So, so here is your basic loadout of arithmetic operations. You've got addition, subtraction, multiplication, right? So far, so good. You actually have two different and distinct types of division which we're going to go through. You have a uh, an operation that you probably have never heard of before called modulus, and we have exponentiation. So let's talk about integer versus floating point division. Integer division is division... Um, so you should, you should sort of couple integer division and modulus in your brain, right? Cast your brains way, way back to elementary school when you were handling long division, right? When you do a long division problem, you get your result remainder something else, right? You get x remainder y. So what integer division is, is it's x from long division. And what modulus is, is it's remainder, the, the remainder, y in this example also from long division. So, for example, if we have the number 13, integer divided by 3, the result is 4, because, of course, um, 3 goes into 13 four times. If we use modulus, the remainder would be 1. So, that's, of course, because 3 times 4 is equal to 12, 13 minus that amount is 1. That's the remainder. So you have a remainder operator, basically. Um, very, 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 very important thing. Integer division will always give you an integer result. Floating point division will uh, should always give you a floating point result, even if it is uh, two integers that you put into it. But I'm And it divides evenly. I'll just check that, though. Yes. So floating point division always returns a floating point number, regardless as to whether the regardless as to whether the inputs are integers or floats, and regardless as to whether or not it divides evenly. Um, obviously, you can, you know, you can perform this on floating point numbers, and you can even perform integer division on floating point numbers. Um, it basically just truncates or chops off the tail. Um, you guys uh, cool so far? Good so far? So... 
when you're composing these types of expressions, in general, Bedmus applies. You know, brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction. Um, the safest bet, however, is to put um, brackets around things. If you're in doubt, just bracket it, right? Um, you can use different types of numbers together, and sometimes you can get unexpected results. Always being good. <laughs> nice. Um, so, here's a cool one, and we won't fully understand why this happens until we study floating point. Um, why does uh, 4.5 integer divide by 2 return a floating point number and not an integer? Um, Because it's like, this is the number of times that 2.2 goes into 4.5, but it's expressed in floating point. I don't, I don't, like, it doesn't really make sense. I wouldn't recommend doing this. I was just, you know, demonstrating a corner case for you. So, here's an interesting one, right? So we have 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1, plus 0.1, plus 0.1, plus 0.1, plus 0.1. Is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right. So, if you add 0.1 together 10 times, what do you think the, the result should be, chat? It should be 1, right? But it's not. The reason for this is that floating point numbers are actually not represented inside of the computer's memory system with exact precision. When you enter 0 0.1, you're not actually entering 0 0.1. You're entering a, a number that is very, very, very close to 0 0.1. Right? So normally it's outside the, like, normally the difference is smaller than the number of digits it displays, but you can make these errors accumulate by performing repeated uh, mathematical operations on them uh, to the point where they actually become visible. Um, just wanted to add, don't confuse integer division with rounding. Integer division always floors the value even if it's more than 0.5. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, excellent point. Thank you, sir. So, for example, uh, so we so you notice um, thirteen integer divide by three gives you four. Um, Fourteen integer divide by three also gives you four. Fifteen integer divide by three gives you five. So this is um, this is sometimes known as a flooring operation because like if you have a if you have a um, if you have a number with a um, Okay, so do, do I just have floor? No, I don't. Import math floor 4.5. Come on. Math.floor. There we go. So floor will take any decimal and pull it down to the... Um, to the to the to the lowest pos like it pulls it down to the whole number. Um, ceiling ceiling there we go pulls it up to the whole number. Right, even if it even if under normal rounding it would be rounded down, ceiling will round it up. Uh, and math dot round will, um, or just round, maybe. Yeah. Round will round it to whichever uh, of those two it would round to under normal rounding rules. Uh, notice, though, that 4.5 exactly rounds down. But if we, uh, if we put, yeah, there you go. So, very slightly. 
is that um, 0 0.9999 to infinity, or does it cut off somewhere? Um, well, oh, let me see if I can remember how to do this format. Um, let's see here. Come on, where is it? There. Format this thing. Um, I think it's 0.60 F. Yeah. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't round it to. It's not infinite nines. Pass past the point where it dis like past the display cutoff. It actually just gets. It it it's it's essentially garbage. <laughs> so that's like that's the number expanded out to sixty decimal places, right? Yeah. What would the floor of four point zero be? Excellent question. Let's try it. Math dot floor four point zero four. Not surprisingly. Also, notice that the floor and ceiling operations return integers, not floats. Good. So, um, as I kind of demonstrated, many mathematical functions which are common are available in the math library. They're kind of used not frequently enough to just be included without having to import them, but I already showed you how to do it. Um, import math. If you put that statement in, then you can say math.this, math.that, and access all of these different things. So like, for example, math.cos, cosine, uh, three. There you go. Um, math.logbase2 of 256 is eight, etc., etc. So let's talk about variables. Um, I've already kind of talked about variables a bit, but so this is kind of like, this is the way that you should be thinking about variables, right? The computer stores memory. It's one of the primary operations of the computer. What the programming language does, one of the things that it handles for you, is it allows you to name segments of memory so that you can refer to those segments of memory by name rather than their numerical memory addresses, right? So essentially, when you in Python say x is equal to 7, what the computer does is it goes out into the memory, selects a piece of memory, puts seven in it, gives the program back a reference to that memory, and so anytime you ask for the value of seven, it goes and looks it up in memory. Uh, variables are also objects. All right. Um, when you ask about the type of a variable, it gives you the type of the thing that's contained at that memory address. So, um, it's useful when you're programming to give your variables useful names. So, if you are calculating the area of a triangle, it is useful, rather than going variable names x, y, and z, to say, you know, base is something, height is something else, and then the area is some function of base and height. Um, you'll often see me use x, y, and z in lecture because the very, like, the, um, the examples I'm often giving are like numerical examples that don't really correspond to anything in reality, right? So it's like, you know, solve for x type problems, right? But uh, yeah. Good. Variables, can, uh, the names of variables, that is, can contain uppercase, lowercase letters, digits, and the underscore character. Variables must not start with a digit 
and must not be one of the reserved words. Um, question. Do we need to write variable names using camel case? No. No, you don't. Um, if you want, like, you can do it any number of ways, you know? You know, let's say you wanted to, you had a variable, like, number of, um, burgers, right? You can't, you can't use spaces because that's not syntactically valid, right? If you put underscores in here, that becomes syntactically valid, number of burgers. If you've been programming long enough, the underscore like reflex of your right hand develops very, very quickly. <laughs> um, as well as like being able to go for like square braces, curly braces. Basically all of those buttons around the enter key that you hardly ever use, those are the programmer keys. And you're gonna learn how to use them when you're a programmer. Um, so what camel case is, is rather than using underscores because they're a bit fiddly, you just capitalize the capitalize the first letter of every word other than the first. So number of burgers is equal to, you know, 15. And that's also valid. You know, you might also call this, you know, uh, num burgers, you know, um, n burgers, n burgs, you know, n bees, n, you could, you know, n, but as, like, as you can see, the more I abbreviate the variable name, the faster it becomes to type, but the less meaningful it is for someone who's trying to read my code, including me, right? NBS, it's like, what does that even mean? You know, Nbergs, it's like, okay, N means number, Bergs means burgers, okay, etc., etc. Uh, generally speaking, you can really shoot yourself in the foot by not selecting, like, useful variable names. There are a bunch of variable names that you're also not allowed to use. So if you remember, while is a word that means something, right? So we can't say while equals seven, right? While is what we know, what we call a reserved keyword. Um, so you can take a look at the full list of them. Import keyword, uh, and then print keyword dot kw list. And these are all of the reserved words of Python. This is actually a quite a small reserved words list relative to a lot of programming languages. Some languages have hundreds of them. Uh, but your reserved words that you're not allowed to use are false, non-true, and as assert, async, await, break, class, continue, def, del, elif, else, except, finally, for, from, global, if, import, in, is, lambda, non-local, not, or, pass, raise, return, try, while, with, yield. Could you use while with a capital W? Maybe. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want, I wouldn't recommend it, though. Because someone who's reading your program will be like, what the hell, they're using a keyword? What? Is it possible to change variable names later on? No. Okay, yeah, no, that's something you can't do. What you can do is you can assign the data in a variable to a new variable name. But um, you can't, like, you can't rename a variable. There's no rename operation. There doesn't need to be one because, you know, us allocating new memory is cheap. It's much cheaper than a, than a renaming operation. So you don't need one. But that's a good question. I've never had that question before. Okay. Um, well, it's 519. I think that that's as far as we can push it today. Um, are there any questions?
Also, would n burgers and n burgers be interchangeable, or would they have be two distinct variables? Um, when programming, pretty much everything is case sensitive. I'm going to rephrase that. Everything is case sensitive. So yeah, um, if n burgers with a small n is one and n burgers is a 10, then n burgers is still one and n burgers is 10. They would be distinct. However, I cannot emphasize enough that this is a terrible programming practice. While they, like, while you can do this, you shouldn't. <laughs> because you're going to confuse the two of them. For sure. When will he ha we have covered all of the content for the assignment? Um, I think probably by the time we reach the end of functions. I don't think there's tuples or strings on uh, assignment one. Maybe Sarth can, uh, can correct me on that one. I'm pretty sure assignment one doesn't have any strings or tuples. When you run your program on Jupyter and pass all the tests, does that... Uh, mean your written in code is correct. It means it passes. It, that means it passes all the visible tests. That does not necessarily mean that it's correct. Um, this is actually something that I talked about during the. Uh... Awesome, thanks, Sarth. Um, that's actually something that I talked about during the um, sort of bonus lecture that we had on uh, during um, um, during thingy. Um, any more coding bat problems you can try? Well, you're certainly permitted to try any of them. But, um, yeah, let's take a look. Coding bat. Why is it so zoomed in? Um, logic one. Yeah. This looks good. Yep, I would say you guys could handle logic one, probably. Um, stay away from string and list until we cover them. Um, even logic two, maybe. Yeah, logic two. I'd say you guys could take logic two at this point. And probably warm up too as well. Let's see. Uh, except for anything that says string on it. <laughs> uh, we haven't covered... I mean, again, you're, you're welcome to try them, but uh, we haven't covered them yet, so you can... Uh, yeah. Yeah, don't do warm up too. Not yet. So I'd say logic one, logic two. Those, those, the, you could, you could take those on at this point. Good. So, um, if there are no further questions, I think I'm going to uh, log off for this evening. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. And try some of the coding bat problems. The link to Teams is on the syllabus. It's under, on the Avenue shell, it's Content Overview with the little, like, projector screen looking thing symbol take her easy folks <laughs>